This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Uh, I would uh, like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I apologize firstly for my English and secondly for quoting a lot of, of text uh, during my presentation. Uh, you will uh, find all uh, the quotes uh, from Gramsci in the handout. Gramsci uh, is a hero for me. This, is, uh, this was how in 2008 Michael Baxton replied to Hans Ulrich Albrecht uh, on the role of the political in his art history. Such an enthusiastic declaration can surprise those who have ever some knowledge of Baxander's work. His style as a writer was, as Veteran Alpers uh, puts it, uh, to be discreet, uh, almost uh, stilty, about uh, his deep intellectual commitments. Gramsci seems to be an exception, though. Baxander's interest in Gramsci is not just curiosity or esteem on an intellectual basis. That which unites uh, the English art historian and the Italian thinker is more an elective affinity, much deeper and intimate than a simple condivision of theory, theories and concepts. In another interview, Baxter has stated, Gramsci is fine for me, and despite of everything, I still feel this, just sort of an emotional attitude. The long intellectual dedication and the never-ending theoretical confrontation that arose from this elective affinity are really fascinating. Again, in the interview with the August Baxter affirmed, I think I'm content to stay with Gramsci. The form is simple, but is also deep in meaning. Staying with Gramsci uh, do, does not only mean uh, reading the prison notebooks, uh, uh, agreeing with or discussing the ideas of the Italian thinker, or even taking position within the political debates on the modern form of Marxism. It also means, uh, if not mostly, getting pleasure from the exchange uh, with an intelligence uh, that is similar to ours, that uh, discreetly but constantly accompanies us and enriches us with its difference. We, what uh, we suggest then is analyzing the path of uh, this staying with Gramsci in Baxander's works. It's a difficult research um, that requires great prudence, but it seems uh, it's Baxander himself uh, who suggests its legitimacy when he, he admitted, uh, in a sense, uh, I would think of myself as Gramscian. The name of Gramsci uh, appears just once in Baxander's work in particular in one of the end notes of Cepolo and the Pictorial Intelligence. Nevertheless, this fact uh, should not harm our research. Uh, it's uh, even possible to argue the contrary and say that Gramsci's presence in Baxander is so constant and deep uh, that it does not need to be made, to be made explicit. Baxander confirms uh, that when he, when he says anybody who knew Gramsci would see that Gramsci was a very strong influence on me. The question may be so, how has Baxter made use or assimilated himself to Gramsci? What kind of intellectual selection has Baxter made from the array of themes, ideas and critical positions contained in the prison notebooks by Gramsci? In order to trace back how Baxter works on Gramsci, uh, it may be useful to remember the context that accompanied his first meeting with the Italian philosopher. Baxander leaves Cambridge in 1955 and he decides to spend an untidy exploratory year in Italy. He is given a research grant to stay at the Collegio Borromeo in Pavia, where he spends the entire winter. He attends uh, some lectures and conferences and makes friends with several Italian foreign students. In uh, his memory book episodes, Baxander remembers among these friends Colombo, I quote, an ascetic lawyer whose passion was left-wing politics from a nanny socialist position. From him, I first learned about the dazzling Gramsci. Gramsci was in fact the main character of the Italian culture debate in the mid-50s. The first partial posthumous edition in six volumes of the prison notebooks had at the time been released and Gramsci had not been known to the wide public before then. 
These are notebooks uh, are a huge treasure for consideration on politics, literature, arts, and folklore. Uh, this is certainly not enough uh, to define the nature of Baxter's approach to Gramsci. Maybe we can wonder whether the conversation with uh, his friend Colombo was combined with other stimuli, for instance, with the lectures of Lanfranco Caretti Baxana attended at Collegio Borromeo. However, referring uh, to Baxander's experience uh, in Pavia risks only to complicate things. We are looking for something uh, straighter that informs us on the main topics Baxter concentrated on once he discovered Gramsci's fault. Let's try a different path then. Soon after having remembered the ascetic lawyer Colombo, Baxter writes, I quote, other sides of my education were the billiard room and a couple of, che of cheap little bars south of the river in Borgo Ticino where the serious drinking was done. These bars are well described in Baxander's posthumous novel, A Grasp of Caspar. It's a broadly uh, autobiographical writing set, among other places, in Pavia in October 1956. Halfway through the novel, we read the following. There were, there were not enough chairs, and several young communists were sitting against the wall on the floor. Briggs used to join in these and listen. His grasp of the Lombard idiom was not of a kind to let him follow the discussion fully. It seemed to be about Gramsci's analysis of common sense, but also about Mussolini's 1938 prohibition of shaking hands in salutation, and presumably about the some relation between these. Here we found something much more concrete and straightforward about Gramsci. There's a concept that of common sense uh, and fictive uh, characters discussing the value of, the con of this concept uh, and its potential application to contemporary reality. So, uh, obviously, this is nothing more than uh, literary fiction, fiction. Nonetheless, it's so improbable to imagine Baxter describing here the true discussion he had while in Pavia. After all, some of the characters of the novel have real names, the names of the friends and the colleagues that Baxter met during his stay in Italy. This path deserves uh, then to be further investigated. In uh, his novel, Baxter writes that uh, the talks of the young communists uh, in the bar seem to be about uh, Gramsci's analysis of common sense. The concept of common sense uh, is the center of Gramsci's political and philosophical project in the prison notebooks. We can even say that this concept constitute, uh, constitutes the generating core of all the Gramscian thought. In a letter to his sister-in-law, uh, Tatiana Schucht, uh, soon after his arrest, uh, Gramsci writes, I would like to concentrate intensely and systematically on some subject that would absorb and provide a center to my inner life. After, after having illustrated his work program that constitutes uh, the architecture of the notebooks uh, written in the following 10 years uh, until his death in 1937, Gramsci adds, at the bottom there is a certain homogeneity among these four subjects, the creative spirit of the people in its diverse stages and degrees of development is in equal measure at their base. The main issue for Gramsci is that of the public spirit. Uh, uh, Gramsci wonders about the difficulties that oppose, especially in Italy, the forming of a common way of feeling and of thinking that would be shared by the intellectuals and the common people, thus allowing for a real national unity. Gramsci's intellectual and political project is based on the recognition of the huge disparity between intellectuals and common people, but also on the knowledge that such a gap can and must be reduced. As Gramsci says, the principle must first be established that all men are philosophers. That is, that between the professional technical philosopher and the rest, Mankind, the difference is not one of quality, but only of quantity. In order to investigate systematically the creative spirit of the people, Gramsci elaborates the notion of common sense. Gramsci defines it as the philosophy of non-philosophers, 
or in other words, I quote, the conception of the world which is uncritically absorbed by the various social and cultural environments in which the moral individuality of the average man is developed. Three characters allow for a better articulation of the nature of this concept. First of all, common sense presents itself according to a great shape of a uh, great range of shapes. Sorry. Every social stratum, Gramsci writes, uh, has uh, its own common sense uh, and uh, its own good sense, uh, which are basically the most widespread conception of, of life and man. Gramsci clearly distinguishes uh, the common sense from the zeitgeist uh, or from the folkgeist. Common sense is not a single, unique conception, identical in time and space. It's the folklore of philosophy, and like folklore, it takes uh, countless different uh, forms. Secondly, for Gramsci, common sense is not something rigid and immobile, but is continually transforming itself, enriching itself with scientific ideas and with the philosophic, philosophical opinions which have entered ordinary life. Common sense is not something like the spirit of the time that flows above the man of a certain epoch. It's more uh, a base of knowledge and skills that that belong to a single individual and th that everyone should use, correct, or integrate. Gramsci writes, uh, the personality of most men uh, is strangely composite. It contains stone-edge elements uh, and principles of a more advanced science, prejudice from all past phases of history, and intuition of a future philosophy, which will be that of a human race united the world over. Less characteristics. Common sense uh, finds uh, its uh, main expression in language. Every language contains the element of a conception of the world uh, and of a culture. Language is not a neutral tool, but a concrete form adopted by every individual or historical group's <coughs> conception of the world. I quote, uh, language also means culture and philosophy, if only at the level of common sense. Language equals thought. Way of talking uh, indicates a way of thinking, Gramsci sums up. And it's uh, at the same time a living thing and a museum of fossils of life and civilizations. Let's abandon Gramsci for a moment and go back uh, to Baxan. The, there is more than one good reason to believe that the concept of common sense uh, evoked in a grasp uh, of Caspar have inspired uh, the intelligence of the author of Plato and the Orators. Let's start uh, with the last characteristic uh, listed above, the unity of language and representation of the world, uh, and the idea of language as a museum of forces of life and civilizations. Clearly, anyone here recognizes an affinity with the theses that are at the base of Baxander's analysis of the humanist observers on paintings. Baxander's main source uh, in this book uh, is not uh, Gramsci, but uh, when Baxander describes uh, language uh, and syntax uh, as being a selective sharpness of attention, we immediately think of Gramsci, and in particular of the several pages where the Italian philosopher analyzes the history of terminology and metaphors as a tool to show how a concept or a new discovered relationship uh, is understood, brought back to the, cultural in the, to the cultural world, historically determined, and finally integrated in common sense. But the affinity between Gramsci and uh, Barsandar becomes even richer and more concrete uh, if uh, we read some lines of the preface to the Italian edition of Giotto and the Oratos. The core lines in the research uh, Barsandar points out, uh, it's not uh, a matter of linguistic determinism, nor of cultural structures. The subject is the integrity both of the historical cultures that we study and of our individual psyche. The ne this need of uh, recognizing the integrity of a culture is articulated in Giotto and the Orators, choosing the, to follow the thread of speech. But the same question also came, uh, comes back in Patterns of Intention in the third chapter and uh, in the fifth uh, chapter of Shadows and Delightment. Now, the concept of common sense uh, formulated by Gramsci seems to exhibit, exhibit uh, well uh, 
this integrity of the cultural formation that deeply interests Baxander. On the other hand, uh, common sense uh, is... Um, sorry, I lost my point. Okay. Um, because um, Baxander... Uh, common, common sense can include, sorry, Stone Age elements, we, let's think, uh, uh, of elementary perceptive skills, uh, but also principles of uh, more advanced science, uh, such as the case of the Lukian culture of the 18th century. On the other hand, sense is common when it's participated in different uh, degrees by the various members of the community. And uh, we can think about this uh, uh, at the usage that uh, Baxner made, makes, uh, made of uh, Paracelsus in the, the lime, uh, lime food uh, sculptures. Uh, in Paracelsus that uh, uh, Baxner says is not a mainstream figure in the either the craftsman or intellectual cultures, but uh, uh, give us uh, a, a general period sense of the sign. Um, finally, com um, Gramsci concept of common sense smartly pairs uh, two characters uh, that uh, seems to me very important uh, uh, to Baxendal. Uh, they are stability and flexibility. Common sense uh, indicates, in fact, a stable network of knowledge and practice uh, in which the action and the thought of any individual is always inserted. Gramsci says we are all conformists of some conformism or other, always men in the mass or collective men. We believe that uh, an analog awareness of the needful conformism of every human action animates the famous uh, statement made by Baxana when uh, he writes, uh, a man of Quattrocento handled the affairs, went to the church, led a social life. On the other hand, though, uh, common sense is also flexible enough to not determine the specific shape uh, that it will take uh, in the individual. Baxendal ponders on a similar issue, we believe, uh, when in words for pictures, he goes back to the Albertis cast of mind uh, and suggests, uh, it's a quotation uh, we ever heard uh, yesterday, that uh, the extraordinary de pictura was not just an outcome of the cultural moment. Perspective and neoclassicism were of the time, motives of balance and, s and mean were certainly of neoclassicism, but the drive that imposed systematic order on painting and the radically selective bent of the order were his and were eccentric. In Giotto and the Oratos, Leon Battista Alberti was recognized as a speechman of the humanistic point of view on paintings. Nevertheless, uh, this humanistic uh, common sense, uh, if uh, we can say so, is not enough to explain the treatise de pictura. It should be hypothetically integrated uh, with a reference to the hypertrophy of a particular mental muscle that lies behind the conceptual algebra, the balancing and compensating habit of the mind of Alberti, Baxander writes. Common sense uh, structures a culture but is differently appropriated by every single man. As Baxner sums up, uh, forms may manifest circumstances, but circumstances do not coerce forms. What uh, uh, has been said on common sense so far offers a still quite a schematic image of the relationship between Gramsci and Baxendal. It will be a matter now of adding details that make the relationship between the two authors more complex and eventually even deeper. Let's go back to Gramsci. As we said, the common sense is seen as a cluster of opinions, convictions, criteria of discrimination and standards of conduct. Gramsci writes, uh, standards of conduct which belong to a certain social group or to a certain culture. Gramsci believes that uh, it, uh, this idea finds its legitimacy in the principle that all men are philosophers. As Gramsci clearly states, uh, although one can speak of intellectuals, one cannot speak of non-intellectuals, because non-intellectuals do not exist. There is no human activity, I quote, uh, from which every form of intellectual participation can be excluded. Homo faber cannot be separated from homo sapiens. 
each man finally, outside his professional activity, carries on some form of intellectual activity. That is, he is a philosopher, an artist, a man of taste, he participates in a particular conception of the world, has a conscious life of moral conduct, and therefore contributes to sustain a conception of the world or to modify it, that, that is, to bring into being new modes or thoughts. Uh, this definition is a consequence of a specific way of conceiving thought and its functions. Gramsci has a strong tendency of describing intellectual activity, even the, mo the more abstract ones, as a mix of intellectual cerebral elaboration and muscular nervous effort. Studying too is a job and a very tiring one he says, with uh, its own particular apprenticeship uh, involving muscle and nerves uh, as well as intellect. Uh, it's a process of adaptation, a habit acquired with effort, tedium, and even suffering. What does distinguish the real intellectual in this continuum? As already mentioned, it's a difference of quantity. The term quantity, say Gramsci, uh, says Gramsci is being used here in a special sense, uh, which is not to be confused with its meaning in arithmetic, since uh, what it indicates is greater or lesser degrees of homogeneity, coherence, and logicality. The intellectual, so, is uh, he who brings common sense to a superior level of coherence and unity, eventually ending up criticizing or renewing it. It's a matter of making, uh, making explicit and unitary the conception of the world that, according to Gramsci, each man contributes in creating of. So, in a first abstract sense, uh, uh, the intellectual for Gramsci is uh, he who gets to the point of developing a critical elaboration of the intellectual activity that exists in everyone at a certain degree of development modifying its relationship uh, with the muscular nervous effort towards a new equilibrium and ensuring uh, that the muscular nervous effort itself uh, becomes the foundation of a new and integral conception of the world. It's a quote from Gramsci. From this uh, general definition of the intellectual activity, Gramsci deduces a famous distinction, that uh, between uh, traditional and organic intellectuals. The first uh, um, traditional intellectual can be defined as an autonomous and independent uh, social group uh, that is uh, uh, identified by the nature of the activities that uh, its members perform. On the contrary, uh, Gramsci writes, uh, every social group uh, coming into existence on the original terrain of an essential function in the world of economic production creates uh, together with itself uh, organically one or more strata of intellectuals which give it uh, homogeneity and an awareness of uh, its own function, not only in the economic, uh, but also in the social and political fields." End of quotation. We can find uh, some examples of this second model of intellectuals, such as the cap capitalist uh, entrepreneurs uh, and uh, the industrial technicians, the specialists of, in political economy, and the organizer of a new culture. Uh, some years ago, uh, Edward Said uh, defiantly proposed uh, uh, to place under the same group of organic intellectuals, I quote, today's advertising or public relations experts who devises techniques for winning a detergent or airline company a larger share of the market. Anyway, uh, what uh, we need to underline here is that uh, these organic intellectuals are distinguished less by their profession, which may be any job characteristic of their class, uh, than by their function in directing the ideas and aspirations of the class uh, to which they organically belong. The definition of organic intellectual is purely functional. It depends only on the relationship uh, with the society or a group uh, towards which uh, organic intellectual assume a role of awareness, uh, of organization, and of direction. The term intellectual uh, so covers a plurality and a gradation of figures, 
artists, journalists, clergy, professors and teachers, but also managers, civil servants, technicians and scientists, lawyers and doctors, that have in common the ability of bringing to a level of higher articulation the relationship between the efforts uh, of intellectual cerebral uh, degree and uh, muscular nervous effort. In this sense, uh, in the modern industrial society, the intellectual is often a specialized uh, uh, technician or an engineer who, by comparison with the unskilled laborer, uh, Gramsci says, not only knows the trade from the, the practical angle, but knows it theoretically and historically. One may, uh, might uh, seem to have left Bachstandal dangerously far behind uh, with uh, this second foray into Gramsci's work. Two quotes uh, will show us that this distance is only illusory. Bachstandal declares twice, uh, what I like in Gramsci, I quote, uh, is the concept of in the intellectual. For me, painters are intellectuals, in a sense. Gramsci's notion of intellectual has been very important for me. I think of artists as Gramscian intellectuals. So, what is left to investigate now is how Pier Francesca, Picasso, and so can be considered Gramscian intellectuals. The first, uh, the most natural hypothesis is connected with the idea uh, that works of art are uh, sometimes historical documents and ar that artists can become uh, witnesses of their culture. I, uh, if uh, we consider them uh, under this point of view, artists, uh, or better, some artists, to show traits uh, that link them to the intellectual described by Gramsci. Some works of art uh, offer, in fact, a highly aware synthesis of the totality of the needs that uh, have contributed to their making and in which they participate. It will be possible to their uh, parallelism. Like, uh, as Gramsci says, all the men participate to a conception of the world, but only some of them uh, bring it to a sufficient degree of homogeneity. In the same way, uh, we can uh, distinguish the great painter from the painter of common sense. I quote from Baxter, only very good works of art, uh, the performances of exceptionally organized men, uh, register in their forms uh, cultural circumstances. Second rate art uh, will be little use, to little use to us. Inferior paintings are impenetrable. So artists, the uh, great artists are for Baxter uh, Gramscian intellectuals because they end up in a synthesis characterized uh, by homogeneity, coherence and logic, uh, the plurality of social and cultural concrete uh, circumstances that converge in their realization. In this sense, it shouldn't sound strange that Baxter doesn't highlight sensitivity taste uh, or originality in the painters he studied, but the fact uh, that they show a high degree of organization. Baxana describes Piero Francesca as a person of exceptional organization. This is in fact uh, this quality that makes painters Gramscian intellectual. I quote uh, from Baxander, a superior craftsman uh, and uh, only the superior one uh, is so organized that he can register within his medium an individual awareness of a period of predicament. However, for Baxander, uh, Gramscian intellectuals mainly means, uh, or maybe only means, uh, organic intellectuals. Baxander and Svetlana Alpers have uh, painstakingly showed uh, what this means uh, when we move in the field of uh, the history of art uh, in the closing pages of Tiepolo and the Pictorial Intelligence. In the framework of a meditation on the third sort of moral aftertaste that characterized the painting of Treppenhaus, the two authors strongly declined, I quote, the view of Tiepolo as the artist of, the of fading aristocracy, the exponent of petty absolutist dream world. The reason of uh, this polemic uh, uh, position can be found in the history of the residence of Wurzburg itself. The true and final cause of the palace are not the members of the von Schoenbrunn's family, but as Baxander and Alpers write, other men 
who shaped and made and used the residents. Uh, these men were specialists, technicians of a sort, many with origins in the craftsman class. The purest paradigm of this class of technicians was the architect Balthasar Neumann. In order to describe Neumann's intellectual physiognomy, Baxter and Alpers quickly trace back the history of the culture of the central European copper industry between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. I quote, this culture um, had first produced a substantial new technical professional class of experts. Mineral surveyors, salary mine, foundry managers, essayers, and metallurgists. This was the highly self conscious culture synthesized by Agricolas de la Metallica, a culture of uh, generalized and also aestheticized technique uh, adaptable to varied particular cases. As it can be seen, uh, we have here a reconstruction of the birth of a group of uh, organic intellectuals that arose, as Gramsci wrote, uh, alongside uh, with the affirmation of a new social group uh, and of a specific productive activity. After having described uh, this context, context uh, and this intellectual genealogy, Baxter and Alpers hint at the same conclusion on Tiepolo. The painter, they write, uh, was a nearly modern technician, and uh, the hegemony his picture affirms, uh, and the class to which uh, he is acting as Victoria intellectual is less that of a prince bishops uh, than of early modern provincial technicians. The presence of the term hegemony definitely signals the depth of Gramsci. A note conveniently underlines that uh, the sense of Victoria intellectual used here derives from Antonio Gramsci's account of organic intellectuals. In the light of what we read uh, in Gramsci's notebooks, uh, it's immediately clear that uh, this statement uh, does not just hint an analogy, but it also provides uh, for an extremely detailed characterization of Tiepolo's art. Baxandal and Alpers uh, firstly tell us that, in a way, Tiepolo is an organic intellectual, an individual that, together with producing images that almost call for dancing, gives expression to the consciousness of a class of we call provincial technicians. Secondly, they underline that Tiepolo acts uh, as an intellectual by painting. What uh, he gives is a pictorial expression of the consciousness of the early modern technicians. Finally, and moreover, they give a particularly clear account of uh, what uh, Gramsci means when uh, he describes the activities of organic intellectuals uh, as specializations of partial aspects uh, of the primitive activity of the new social type that uh, the new class uh, has brought into prominence. <laughs> Sorry for the long quotation. In fact, uh, Tiepolo does not express the aspirations and values uh, of the class uh, he belongs to by painting technicians or craftsmen at work. Tiepolo is a pictorial intellectual because of how he paints, not for what he paints. Painting, rather, the articulation of the painting activity is a tool uh, itself through which Tiepolo expresses his function of Gramscian intellectual that tries to give homogeneity and awareness to a social class. It's the phasing of operations that aligns the painter Tiepolo with the technician, Svetlana Alpers and uh, Baxander says. Say, uh, Tiepolo thinks by painting and uh, the stuff of this operation, the kind of painting articulated by these phases, as it is based on craft, manual, and habitual experience, tradition, and visual instinct, uh, makes visible the strictly provincial character of this class of early modern technician. So the technical phasing of operations united to the non-technical nature of his painting is the form that Tiepolo chooses to perform his function of pictorial intellectual. <coughs> it seems difficult to me to imagine a more rigorous, but also a more original application of Gramsci's definition of organic intellectuals. The figure of Tiepolo does not just offer a very coherent example of Gramsci's concept 
by enlarges the application of this concept to painting, a subject Gramsci didn't study, and where the characteristic traits of the notion of organic intellectual become more clear. If we try to sum up the meandering path uh, we have followed uh, so far, uh, we, may, uh, we might say that uh, Baxander finds uh, in Gramsci a model of refined analysis that studied, uh, studies societies and cultures as uni unitary realities that are characterized by great integrity. This integrity finds a partial expression in the common sense to which uh, the intellectuals, especially if considered as organic intellectuals, contribute uh, with their technical and artistic skills. Are these reasons too modest uh, to be content uh, to stay with Gramsci? Uh, I don't think so. Anyway, as we said, uh, this is just a point of view on Gramsci, a grasp of Gramsci. We have left out a lot of thought uh, and uh, of the Italian philosopher. Maybe we even left out uh, what was essential. Uh, reading the title of my contribution, one might uh, expect a discussion on the issue related to the ideology, to the relationship between Marxism and the history of art, uh, or to the tension between structure and superstructure. Mm, we cannot deny that Baxander was uh, interested in all this. If we go into uh, greater detail, uh, it seems even difficult to deny the closeness of Baxander and Gramsci in criticizing every form of purely economic explanation of the social phenomena. We could also suppose that uh, one of the main reasons why Baxander finds Italian Marxism uh, hugely attractive uh, is the way in which uh, Gramsci liquidates any externalized relation between uh, structures and superstructure. Gramsci say their distinction has purely didactic value since the material forces uh, would uh, be inconceivable historically without form uh, and uh, the ideologies would be individual fences without the material forces. Despite uh, these affinities uh, are really suggestive, they seem to me to appear marginal. If they can tell us something about the nature of Baxander's Marxism, they do not tell us anything on the usage that Baxander makes of Gramsci in his art history. Uh, I want to quote uh, a, a sentence um, from uh, the interview with uh, Langdahl when uh, Baxander says uh, hegemony, so the key, uh, the key concept of uh, Gramsci, hegemony doesn't appeal to me. That isn't the thing. Well, in a sense, okay, but uh, I don't uh, get much uh, mileage out of that. So for Baxander, Gramsci is especially the thinker of common sense, uh, I think, uh, and the inventor of a new intellectual figure, the organic intellectual, not the theorist of the ideological uh, hegemony of the historical bloc. Is a new Gramsci, a not very Marxist uh, Gramsci. Is a more of a Gramsci uh, who also speaks of art uh, and uh, who follow, uh, allows us to differently conceive the role of the artist. Uh, one of the reasons of Gramsci's appeal, uh, according to Baxala, is, uh, I quote, uh, that uh, he is not over explicit. He leaves room uh, for one to think uh, oneself. The closing pages of Chapel and the Pictorial Intelligence are a perfect evidence of this truth. We started, started with a quote, uh, let's go back uh, to it to conclude. I think I'm content to stay with Gramsci, Baxander say. It's a matter of staying in the universe, uh, and the part of the attraction of Gramsci to me is that uh, the, there is so much uh, there, and if one brings in other universes that are systematically different, uh, then one can do damage to one's first intuition. The outcome of the cause of this long and patient staying with Gramsci is a deep uh, community of universes that is apparent uh, to everyone who reads uh, the true orders, but uh, which is difficult to put into words. Uh, may, maybe, probably the best synthesis of what uh, unites the thought of these two authors is uh, hidden in a sentence that Gramsci 
quotes more than once in the notebooks and uh, which have been pondered upon by Baxter as well. It comes uh, from the incipit, uh, incipit of the first book of uh, the, the Pittura or Don Battista Alberti. And it says, uh, mathematicians measure the shapes and form of things uh, in the mind alone and divorced entirely from matter. We, say Gramsci and uh, Baxter, on the other hand, uh, who wish to talk of things that are visible, we use, a, as they say, a Minerva in a fullness, una più grassa Minerva. Thanks. Thank you very much. But one of the things that I've got, yeah. one of the things that it made me think of was simply that there was, when you said this is a new ground sheet, which it is for me, you know, in a, in a beautiful way, um, that it, the relationship between the Baxendahl and the Academy, yeah. in a sense, seems to evolve the way the relationship between, say, ground sheet and Togliatti. <laughs> okay. To put that to you. Yeah, it's a. First, uh, first of all, about uh, new Gramsci, it's especially about uh, the thing that uh, Gramsci, Gramsci notebooks, uh, are huge, huge, huge uh, books, uh, six volumes, uh, is uh, very huge, and uh, you find uh, uh, almost nothing about art history. It's really strange. So I think it's uh, new Gramsci because it's a uh, Gramsci that uh, spe who speaks uh, about art history or can uh, uh, be useful to speak about art history. About Toyata and Gramsci, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the relationship between Toyata and Gramsci is so, it was so difficult anyway, but uh, as the, the relationship between uh, Baxander and the academies, but uh, yes, but it's possible it's, uh, it suggests... I was thinking about Gramsci to canonical Marxism, yeah? even as, you know, the development yeah. And that's not. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, uh, for Italian Marxism, Gramsci, Gramsci is the 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 founder, the founder figure, but uh, is an eccentric, eccentric uh, figure. So in this sense, I think it's uh, it's difficult to 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 position. Baxander in the history of uh, art history, and uh, the same way it's difficult to position Gramsci in the history of Marxism. In this sense, I think uh, the parallelism is okay, but uh, Toyata and Gramsci is a little more difficult, <laughs> I think. Yeah? If I, I suppose there are various art historians who are Gramscian enough to write about artists as Gramscian historical actors. Yeah. I think there's one that comes to mind is Ferdinando Bologna's okay. Caravaggio. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's Bologna's very Gramscian at a, at a deep level. Yeah. It doesn't use any Gramscian terminology yeah. in the book, but it's, it's very obvious. That okay. He styles Caravaggio as yeah. a Gramscian historical actor who, who lives in a world not of his own making. Yeah but is still able to exercise some movements. Okay. I re I've read uh, Fabiano Bologna monographs uh, several years ago, but the suggestion, but uh, I don't remember that uh, there's something that sounds like organic intellectual in, the, in, in this analysis. Uh, I'm thinking more of the idea of the historical actor. Okay. Okay, I will, I will check. I don't remember very well the, the monograph. I've read, but yeah, uh, it's, it's not. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In Audi. Uh, no, no. It's, uh, both or okay. Like Thank you very much, anyway. Yep. Yeah, so, um, I'm sure we all like falling in love with Italians, but <laughs> I wonder whether um, the dazzling Ramshi uh, was dazzling because the steed bit um, as a matter of intellectual history. Mm -hmm. laid uh, not in Lombardy, uh, but uh, in Cambridge. 
and um, chiefly under the influence uh, uh, of uh, FRD lists. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether you consider, sort of, you know, to what extent um, all the different in some ways, um, the languages are, are all um, uh, of grammaticals and choosing uh, in, in, in his own maturity. Mm -hmm. But I wonder whether some of these concepts, the you know, elimination of basic superstructure, the, the importance of um, kind of organic nature of ideas um, uh, flowing up and down, often mm -hmm. in, in, in the Levis and above, mm -hmm. uh, to more judgmental way um, uh, down. But nonetheless, I mean, many of these concepts can be very, very easily be described mm -hmm. um, in kind of Levis type terminology. And I wonder whether, um, you know, as a matter of the kind of intellectual archaeology, uh, back to the yeah. Um, that, that made sense to you. Yeah. Um, Garci was very, very, very interested in linguistic, the linguistic of the uh, 20s. So he, there's a lot of notes on linguistic uh, problems and so on. Uh, but I think uh, what uh, interested uh, Baxander is not this point, I think it's more general. The idea, there's a, I know I not uh, spoke about this, but the several notes uh, in the notebooks, uh, the title is uh, uh, um, how to, to translate, uh, encyclopedic notions. And the uh, Gramsci um, picks in the, in the journal or in the conversation some uh, term used uh, by everyone uh, and they try to uh, explore uh, what is uh, hidden in above these terms. So I think it's uh, this idea that uh, the language uh, is a sort of, the of uh, encyclopedia of uh, vision of the world, of conception of the world. And uh, I think it's this idea that uh, interested uh, uh, Baxter because uh, about the position of uh, Baxter on language and so on uh, derives uh, from French uh, and American uh, uh, anthropology, from Wolfian uh, determinism, uh, from, uh, I, uh, we have uh, said uh, yesterday, from uh, uh, Quine or uh, Wittgenstein. So I think uh, the language uh, point is not the most, uh, the most important in the discussion, in the relationship with Gramsci. Uh, but this idea that uh, we have an encyclopedia uh, of uh, uh, hidden in the language uh, interested uh, a lot uh, uh, Baxter. So I, I don't know if I, I have answered, but uh, I, I have uh, the impression you, you will going uh, away from Gramsci, from Baxter with uh, your suggestion. No, I, I was simply suggesting, I wonder what you said, you know, above all the concept of organic intellectual, um, and the absolutely um, what I said can be useful, uh, uh, can be re-described in this kind of FRE, this like term, 1950s, mm. um, which we, we know from uh, two references and interviews, this, this was a significant for, for Baxendor. And so, several, and, and also the, the reference you make to the elimination of basic superstructure, which you, uh, okay. uh, that's already instinct um, mm. in the later versions of the Lucas uh, Site project. Um, so I just wondered whether, as, as a matter of purely kind of intellectual archaeology, mm. um, yeah, that, that would be something worth considering as it's kind of seedbed. Okay, I know, but I'm not very sure uh, to. I'm not. I'm not the same impression. So, <laughs> so I'm not sure that, that uh, it's useful to, to search uh, this one. Anyway. Yeah. I didn't. I wasn't quite sure. I would second that. I Gramsci is marked by a very obvious, explicit ethical and political commitment that yep. is so central to his writing. Yep, yeah. um, and I wonder whether what one's got in the case of Jackson is a sort of aspiration to something that he doesn't necessarily want to exemplify. Okay, it's a set Gramsci represents a set of aspirations yeah. which he finds incredibly admirable, but he's not going to occupy that position. Mm. It's a, it's a very, very, very good uh, suggestion. Uh, I have to say that the description of common sense of organic intellectual I've done, it's static. But for, Bax, uh, for Gramsci, uh, it's, uh, the content is dynamic. You have to overcome uh, the common sense to construct a new ethical uh, organism 
So, in this sense, I think, yes, I think uh, Barcelona's uh, showing Gramsci is somebody like, some, somebody that was able to unite, uh, unite uh, uh, historic approaches uh, with a very, very moral engagement. Yes, uh, if probably it's, uh, it's a sort of, the, of a uh, hidden uh, side of uh, his personality. So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good suggestion. Yeah. Those are quality and superiority. Yeah. And I'm thinking here particularly about the relationship or the potential the tension between two of your quotes, quote 11. Yeah. Um, Yeah, uh, I understand. I think uh, for me, it was, I was struck by this sentence of Baxander uh, speaking about superior craftsmen, and uh, it was strange. Uh, and when I, I've read uh, Gramsci that speaks of quantity like a lever of organization, I've said, uh, so it's not superior, it's not a judgment, uh, it's something like a more organized mind, more organized. Uh, Personality. So I think uh, there's a tension only in the, the in, in the choice of the uh, the term, and I think uh, Bastian was uh, a little bit uh, proud of uh, write something very 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 stupid, very a little bit uh, shocking, and uh, but uh, at, the, at the end uh, he I think uh, he said that. Uh, a superior craftsman is not a better painter. It's a better uh, painter that uh, as a, uh, is able to make a more organized articulation of the circumstances. So I think there's not a tension, but uh, maybe Gramsci uh, is useful to understand a little bit more uh, Baxana in this sentence uh, and uh, in other sentences when he says the, the same thing, uh, inferior paintings are uh, <coughs> Uh, what's the term? Uh, term uh, inferior painting are impenetrable. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's very strange. I think uh, the, the idea of organization is uh, impenetrable because uh, you, it's not sufficiently organized to enter. So thank you anyway. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's mildly speaking problematic because we're forgetting that all these principles are directed towards, besides other things, of course, for an ultimate change in society. Yeah. But it, 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 it's, I think it's not me, it's uh, Baxana. When he said uh, hegemony is okay, but uh, I think uh, it's not interesting, I think it, the idea is this one. Gramsci is a political thinker. He's a po politic death thing, and he think to, to make politics. But uh, when uh, we are in the history of art uh, with Baxana, I think. Uh, we have to neutralize uh, from a political point of view this concept. It's, it's the reason why Baxter chose the uh, common sense and the organic intellectual and not hegemony, ideology, structure and superstructure. It's a choice, it's a, it's a grasp of Gramsci, it's a, it's a, a vision uh, of Gramsci. It's not, it's not a good Gramsci. I've, uh, I'm, I'm a philosopher, I, n I never wrote something on Gramsci with this text. Uh, it's, a, it's a really strange Gramsci, but you have reason for Gramsci. Common sense uh, has to be uh, overcome, so it's something you have to, 
to change uh, to a new conception, a new order. So it's not something st static, but dynamic, you know, as I said uh, before. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a it's a good observation because uh, uh, Gramsci Gramsci uh, use, uh, uses this term to say that uh, common sense uh, is something concrete, uh, wi widespread uh, that everybody use, even if uh, he can verbalize uh, or can explicit. Uh, this one. So it's common and it's a sense, uh, it's a way of perceiving things. So it's something to overcome. Uh, we have to become uh, aware of this common sense, uh, not to reject. And uh, there's an opposition that uh, Gramsci sometimes uses uh, common sense, uh, a good sense. Uh, there was a, a quote uh, with this opposition common sense is uh, something that uh, remains. Uh, uh, beyond awareness uh, and good sense, uh, it's a common sense uh, uh, that arrive to the awareness. But again, the, the important thing is sense. Yeah. The, the yeah. The yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, the reason why Baxter was interested uh, because Pio died as something something like uh, uh, very similar for me to common sense in this way. Okay, sorry. Because I do think we have to yeah. continue the discussion now. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay.